Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Executive Pastor Tracy Myers, and I'll be with you this morning, bringing the bread of life. I want to give deference to my husband, Overseer Dwayne Myers Sr., for allowing me this opportunity to come before you. I want to celebrate God for you, you, and especially you. Thank you for coming to worship with us today at Life Changers Family Worship Christian Center worship experience here at our cyber church thank you so much we are church where lives are being changed one person at a time i'm excited that you decided to tune in with us today and i believe it was by divine appointment my prayer for you today is that you would be blessed your life transformed and renewed by the power of the word of god and so at this time i want to uh say thank you to all of the members of Life Changers this morning. And I wanna give you an opportunity and time to sow your seed this morning uh, via Cash App. Our uh, Cash App address is LCHQRD, which will be provided below, as well as PayPal. If you decide to give via PayPal, LCHQRD, it's giving time in the sanctuary. I would that you would please, ma'am, please, sir, make your uh, way over to either one of those uh, payment vendors, again, Cash App or PayPal, and sow your seed, give your tithes and your offerings. It's right to do right. And God blesses and he loves a cheerful giver. Amen. And so I want to give you a few moments to do that. And by way of announcement, we again celebrate uh, the Dancy family for their grand opening yesterday at CPR, Duluth, Georgia. We praise God for all uh, that God's doing in their lives and in their business. And we have come alongside them as life changes and supported them yesterday. And we had a grand old time at the grand opening. We want to invite you on the first Sunday of next month to be with us as we worship and praise in the park. Hallelujah. Praise in the park, the flyer will be low, amen, and on the Facebook, but we want to invite you to come out. We're going to have the word of God brought by none other than our overseer, Dwayne Myers. We're also going to have some wonderful um, activities. We're going to have our chili cook-off after service. We're going to break bread while we usually have communion, but also we'll be having, uh, as we uh, eat and dine with one another in fellowship, we'll be having a chili contest. So for those of you who would love to come and participate, fellowship, worship with us and dine with us after, we invite you. We invite you to be our guest on first Sunday as we fellowship in the park. Again, we're being COVID compliant. We're wearing masks and practicing social distancing. So you don't have to worry about any of those things. If you don't have a mask, one will be provided for you. We would just love to come and see you, fellowship with you, amen, and praise and worship God with you on first Sunday. So would you be our very special guest? Hallelujah. We look forward to seeing you. Amen. Amen. At this time, I would that you would join me in a word of prayer as you prepare for the word of God. If you would bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today. We thank you because you're God and beside you, there's none other. We thank you for waking us up this morning in our right minds with the blood running warm through our veins. We thank you for the activity of our limbs. We thank you for watching over us as we slept last night that no hurt, harm, or danger came near our dwelling. We just honor you today for this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in this. Come on and magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Father, we boast in your goodness and in your kindness and we celebrate celebrate you today because you're great and you do miracles so great. So come Lord Jesus, even now and tabernacle amongst us. We thank you for your spirit that gives life. We ask that you would breathe, breathe on this service. Allow me to decrease so that you may increase. Use these lips of clay to declare unto your people what you've given me, Father. It's not by might or by power, but it's by your spirit. So thank you in advance for saving. Thank you in advance for healing. Thank you in advance for delivering and setting every captive free. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. All the people of God said, thank God and amen. Hallelujah. We rejoice in the God of our salvation today. 
and we just thank kind of the privilege and honor to be before you this morning. I would that you would turn with me to the book of Joshua, the second chapter, the book of Joshua, the second chapter. And here begins the reading of God's word. Joshua 2 and 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out, out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, behold, there came men in hither to nigh of the children of Israel to search out the country. Verse three, and the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab saying, bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. So far the scripture. If I would use for a title for today's message, it would be Rahab, a hole in the wall, a hole in the wall. We're talking about Rahab, but the title would be a hole in the wall, a hole in the wall. How many of you have heard or even used that term before, a hole in the wall? Um, it's usually to describe a place of you know, major consequence, not the best appearance, a place where usually it's small and um, you know, less lovely on the outside or even on the inside. And so we will reference that place. You know, it's a hole in the wall. It could be a location. It could be a store. It could be a restaurant. It could be a, a dwelling place, someone's residence. And sometimes in describing it, we may say, oh, you know, it's on Jefferson Street, a little hole in the wall, a little hole in the wall. How many have been to some restaurants, amen? And you say, you know, don't look for any fanfare. It's a little hole in the wall, but the food is great. The food is great, right? Um, or you may they say, hey, this is there's a church down on such and such street. It's a little hole in the wall church, but the spirit of God is moving in that place. Hallelujah. Come on. Well, how about you may reference somebody's location, you know, residence. You could say, my grandma lives somewhere down the road and cut back behind the trees. And it's a little house back there. It's not too big. It's, you know, a little hole in the wall. But, you know, if you go there, you're going to have a good time. She's going to feed you in the fellowship and family's real good. So a lot of times we reference a hole in the wall as a place that, again, uh, may be small, may not have the best appearance, but there's something there. There's something there that keeps drawing us back to that place. It could be the food, amen, the best fish or the best lemon pepper wings fried in a little hole in the wall somewhere in the deck, in the cater, amen. Or it could be you love your grandmother's company or your family's company, and it may be a little small hole in the wall somewhere in the projects, but guess what? At that house, there's love. At that hole in the wall, there's family, there's love laughter, there's communion, amen. And sometimes you may go to a grand palace uh, in a country club and you may not experience the love, the joy, the peace that you may find in someone's home that may be referred to as, yes, a hole in the wall. And so uh, I bring that up because Rahab, Rahab, this woman that the Bible refers to often, and we refer to her as the harlot the harlot. And yes, she was the harlot. The harlot is another word for prostitute, one that sells their bodies for sexual favors, amen, for um, monetary gain. Rahab was indeed a harlot. And Rahab was a Canaanite and she lived in Jericho. And the Bible lets us know she lived in the walls of Jericho. So, you know, that would be considered, you know, inside the wall. If you see a little window, that's like a hole in the wall, right? It wasn't any glamorous place. Some people in Bible times lived in the walls, the walls, they lived in the walls. And so Rahab lived in the wall of Jericho. Not only did she live on the walls of Jericho, she was one, again, that was a harlot. That meant that not only did she sell sex for money, but Rahab also, her home was also used as a lodging place. It was considered an inn where travelers that came and went would come and get what you would call maybe bed and breakfast, but maybe more the bed than breakfast. Amen. And so she was known for her reputation for not only lodging travelers and visitors, but also accommodating them with se sexually forgiveness. Game. So we have this woman, Rahab, who's in Jericho. She lives there. She dwells there. She is uh, raised around pagans. She's raised around those who may have not um, had the best uh, upbringing. And all she knew was what she knew, which was K K K 
Canaanite pagan culture. So at this time, Rahab is considered a sinner. She's considered a prostitute. She's considered one that's rejected. Again, all she did to maintain her lifestyle of living was sell her body. Can I tell you um, another way that Rahab uh, uh, had prepared a cost of living? She also um, had flax. Flax and flax was the tall, tall uh, types of plants that grew maybe three feet tall. And she would take them and dry them, put them on her roof, and she would dye them a certain color red. And she would make linen out of those or rope out of those. So Rahab was kind of an entrepreneur, a lady of the day. She took care of her business. She had did things inside, you know, indiscreet. You know, she used discretion for her private business, but no doubt she was known for what she did. But she also had another side hustle. She sold. Uh, linen or ropes and dyed them red. Amen. And we speak of, we know of another woman, amen, of the New Testament who sold ropes or who sold linen and she dyed them purple. But we're talking about Rahab today. So Rahab was the woman who was wise. She had, you know, her own business and she had two businesses to be said. But one thing about Rahab we find in scripture was that Rahab was a woman who no doubt God had prepared for a time such as this. Again, a hole in the wall. Someone who lived in a hole in the wall in the walls of Jericho, God had prepared, prepared Rahab to receive these two spies. We know that the book of Joshua is about Joshua, who was the successor of Moses, who had died. And 39 years he was with Moses, his assistant. And Joshua was only one of two individuals that were still living that actually were eyewitnesses to all of the miracles that God did in Egypt, to uh, the exodus uh, out of Egypt and uh, the wanderings um, and exodus and so in the wilderness. So Mo, uh, Joshua was one who was able act, he was faithful, and it was now his turn to lead the children of Israel, amen, from the wilderness now into the promised land. Joshua uh, in Hebrew is Yeshua, and Yeshua means Yahweh saves or Yahweh delivers. So there are three principal Joshua's in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are two. The one we're speaking of, Joshua, uh, the son of Nun, who was a military general leader who led the children of Israel out of the wilderness into the promised land. But there's also, and that's just like Jesus, that Joshua is a type of Jesus who's leading us as people from a world of sin, a lifestyle of sin into life eternal and everlasting. And then there's another Old Testament, Joshua, who was a priest who led the people, children of uh, Israel from Babylon into the promised land. So again, another type of Christ where Jesus, amen, is leading us out of the lifestyle, the culture of Babylonian sin, the culture of our lifestyle, the, of, of bondage and sin into deliverance, life eternal liberty, freedom, joy, and happiness. And of course, we have Jesus the Christ, the Lord, the Savior of the world, we find in the New Testament. So Joshua, we see, he's uh, uh, preparing to take the promised land. And before he does that, he sends two spies out and tells them, go spy the land. I want you to gather, survey, get some intel, so we know what we're working with before we go and possess the land. Same thing happened years ago when Moses sent Joshua among 11 other spies to spy out the land. Amen. And we know the story. 10 came back with negative reports and only two, say Joshua and Caleb, came back with favorable reports that said, guess what? We are well able to take the land. And so Joshua, no doubt, said this time I'm going to send two. I'm going to send two, two faithful men that will go in and spy out the land and come back and tell me what they find. And so the two spies go in. And they go into Jericho. Jericho was important because Jericho was a formidable place. It was a formidable place. It was a place that had a walls that were built at least 13 thick feet thick and uh, almost, I mean, I'm sorry, 13 feet high. And they had uh, security towers, 28 feet high. And, and they were humongous in height and, and in depth. And those walls were built to keep intruders out, human intruders out. And so no doubt the Canaanites that resided inside Jericho felt that they were well secure. They were well secure. But how many of you know that there's no wall that can be built? There's no um, circumference. There's nothing that can 
can be done that is any type of opposition for the Lord. Come on, nothing you can go through, nothing you could do, nothing that you've did is so bad, so horrible, so deep, so impenetrable that God is not able to reach through those walls, amen. And so we see how Jer Joshua sends out the two spies and they go into Jericho and they go into Jericho and they try to, again, this is a practice of espionage. They're spying out the land, gaining intel to go back and tell the military leader, Joshua, come on, Yahweh, that says how he can strategically take this land. Not only was uh, Jericho formidable in its structure, but it was also positioned right along the beachhead, right, amen, across the Jordan. And they had to take that city first before they further went into possess all of Canaan. And so its location, its proximity, as well as its fortitude. Joshua needed to know how do we take this land? Can I tell you today, Jesus that says is well able to take any land of your life, amen, the land of your heart, the land of your mind, amen, and able to overtake it for his glory, his honor, and his use. Because they understood the promise that God had gave them that they will enter into a land flowing with milk and honey. So these two spies, they enter into Jericho and what other place to go to, but the place where everybody goes, Rahab's house, come on. She, where she lived in the wall was one where she was able to entertain caravan of travelers. They came and they went and they no doubtly lodged at her place of business. Now, I don't want you to think these two spies went there for any shady kind of business. Come on. She lived in what we would call the red light district where anything went on out after hours, hallelujah, secret and hid away, tucked away for the men and women of night, for discreet, you know, appointments and happenings. And so these two spies were at Rahab's house. The Bible says they lodged there. They didn't lodge there while to uh, partake of any ill repute or any activities that would bring dishonor, reproach to Israel or Joshua, but they went there and they lodged there, no doubt, getting information, finding out what's going on. But the Bible lets us know that in going there, it got word back to the king that these two Israelites had come into the camp. They are now in Jericho. And now they're in Jericho. They want to, uh, they came to spy. We know that they came to spy so that they can come take the land. Of course they knew that. The king knew that. The king is like a symbol of Satan, right? Here comes God. Here comes the Holy Spirit. Here comes the word coming to deliver, coming to save, coming to set free. And that devil don't want you to get free. And so he wants to kill. He wants to steal. And he wants to destroy. But how many know that he's already a defeated foe? Hallelujah. And so here we have the king sending out his officers going to Rahab's house and saying, I know that those men are there. And so send them out to us. What I love about Rahab the harlot, she's vilified for what she did. She's vilified for her lifestyle. How do I know? Because she's not mentioned in anywhere in the scripture absent of the harlot. Come on, Rahab the harlot. I want to pause right here and let you know you are not what you did. You've not what you've done. Even though people may label you a harlot, they may, may label you a drug addict. They may label you a convict. They may label you a liar. Amen. Hon, you may have done those things and I'll go one step further. You may be doing those things, but let me tell you something. Jesus, the Savior, the Deliverer, the one that comes to save, can cleanse you, purify you, save you, and give you a brand new name and a brand new star. So here we have Rahab the harlot, and the King Jericho's officers are coming, and they say, send them out, send them out. You may be asking, why didn't they just go in and take the two spies? By no doubt, they were the king's officers. Well, in Bible days, where you lived was, and where you, you know, did business. I mean, she lived there, but she also did business there. People with, you know, they, they, they gave you honor for that. They didn't just barge in your house like people do today. They don't just have no knock warrants. Come on, somebody. Come on. Come on. We still praying for Brianna Taylor's family. They don't just exercise no knock warrants and bust your house down and come in because they think they have the right. They respected your home. And just like we find that in the book of Genesis with Sodom and Gomorrah, amen, where they wouldn't just those, those that came in to get those angels that Lot was holding, they didn't just break the door down. They said, send them out. Amen. Send them out. And so here we have the officers telling Rahab, send them out. 
But what I love about this story is that Rahab, even though she's referred to as a harlot, the Lord had already prepared Rahab to receive these men. How do I know? Because Rahab was willing to risk hiding these men on the roof of her house. That's recorded in verse four through six. Hide these men in the, on the roof of her house and deny and commit an act of treason with the king to save these men's lives. Come on, somebody. Rahab the harlot was being used by God. He was, she was being used by God instead of turning them over to the king. Amen. For maybe some type of um, reward or just to be compliant or just to be a good citizen of Canaan and Jericho. She said, no, no, no. I, I, I perceive who they are. And so she goes and she hides them. She takes them out. Amen. She takes them out and she hides them upstairs. She tells the officers, no, they're not here. They came, but I don't know where they went. And in the meantime, she tells them, she hides them up on the top of her roof. She takes them out and she hides them. And she tells the, the, the officers they came, but when it was night and the gate shut, they went out. I don't know, you might wanna pursue them. You might wanna find them. They're somewhere on their way back, but they're not here. Do you understand the risk that she took doing that? In Bible times, if you committed an act of treason, they would guide, gouge your eyes out. They would tear you from limbs and drag you in the street until you, I mean, alive and then stoned you if you didn't die through that ordeal. She took the risk of harboring and hiding the men of God. I want to challenge you and I want to propose to you as a believer, you've got to be willing, amen, you've got to be willing the lessons we can learn, you've got to be willing to do what it takes for the kingdom. Amen. You've got to be willing when God presents opportunities to you and you know it's the Lord, you got to be willing to do those things. You've got to be willing, amen, to sometimes even die. You've got to be willing, amen, for if it costs you your family, if it costs you your career, if it costs you everything, you've got to be willing. Jesus said in the New Testament, amen, if any man, amen, wants to follow me, you've got to first deny yourself. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. If you want to be, and Kimmy, this is not for everybody. I know everybody may not be gangster enough, risky enough to walk this walk with, uh, with Christ. But he said, if you want to walk with me, if you want to be my disciples, if you want to live this Christian life, baby, you better be ready. You better be ready to deny yourself, deny your career, deny your ambitions, deny your agendas, deny yourself, deny your desires, your affections, what you had planned, who you wanted to be with, what, how you charted your course, deny that, forget that. Take up your cross and follow me. That cross represents death. The cross represents suffering. Be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want to reign with him, but we don't want to suffer with him. But I want to know him and the power of his fellowship. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Hallelujah. So Rahab gives us an example of being risky enough. Again, she has not even, she's not even an Israelite. She is a Canaanite. She is a Gentile. She's not even a privy to the laws of God. She's not even privy, amen, to the, to the, to the, um, uh, to the, to the blessings of God. But at this moment in her time, Rahab had heard about, she heard about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She heard about the miracles that they did. She heard about the fact that the killed, how Joshua and the Israelites, amen, overcame the kings of the Amorites, the king of Sihon and all. She heard no doubt about the testimony of God parting the Red Sea, she tells them, listen, I realize that the God that you serve, the God that you serve is God of heaven and earth beneath. Hallelujah. So even though she was a harlot, they vilify her for what she did. But can I tell you, hallelujah, this same harlot that came from a hole in the wall was one that God was using. God was using in the plan and the purpose of, for the children of Israel to take the land. 
I don't want you to ever think that what you did, where you came from, is any indication that God will not use you, God does not love you, and God will not get the glory out of your life. He will take an absolute mess of a life, an absolute tragedy of a life, an absolute testimony, amen, of, 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 of poverty, of sickness, of disease, amen, and use it for his glory. Oh, yes, he will. Rahab is a testimony of just what our God will do. And so not only was Rahab risky, amen, she was willing to take risks. And not only did she realize, amen, that God, the Yahweh, Jesus, hallelujah, was the only God. Again, she lived amongst pagan people. And my Holy Ghost imagination, if I was, I would like to think that Rahab, amen, and the lifestyle that she had was used to being rejected. Come on, I'm good enough to lay down with. I'm good enough, amen, to give you pleasure, but that's it and no more. Nobody married her because she was, of course, Rahab the prostitute, Rahab the harlot. Come on. But can I tell you something? Harlotry, prostitution, there's a biblical harlotry. We've all at some time played the harlot. The scripture tells us so. We've committed fraud. We've been unfaithful to our God. It's times where we have been unfaithful just like Israel was to God and went whoring after other gods. Yes, we as even believers today, the church today, Christians today are unfaithful to God time after time again and go whoring after other gods, the God of mammon, the God of money, the God of pleasure, come on, the God of academia. We go after gods all the time and we commit harlotry. We play the harlot. Oh yes, we do. Don't you look down your nose on Rahab because she lied with men. She may have lied with men, but amen, you may have lied with money. You may have lied with other things. And so here we see her not only realizing that God is the only God. She made a decision in this lifestyle that she lived in the wall, this hole in the wall where travelers came and news was shared and gossip was spread, amen, and you, all kind of pagan practices and rituals were probably being done because all the people that came through there lodged at her end, no doubt. So she was used to all manner of carnality, futility, and I believe she was sick and tired of this false gods they presented. But the God she heard about that can able, was able to part the Red Sea, no doubt Rahab was already in her heart being changed and being pricked and made up in her heart and mind before those two spies even came, before she made a quick decision to hide them, before she told them, listen, I know who you are, that she was poised and prepared to follow their God. So Rahab goes on further and she starts to have dialogue with these men and she tells them, listen, after the, the, the officers leave, she goes up to them and she tells them, I realize that, you know, you all, your God is the God. And I want to, I want to share something with you. Amen. After she, she tells them, listen, you know what? We've heard about your God and listen, the men of Jericho, we are scared. We scared, we scared. The, our coverage has waxed, it's melted. We already know that you coming to take this country, you coming to take Jericho. We got nothing for y'all. We fronting, we got these walls up. Come on, and we do that. We put walls up in our lives. We put walls up. We put these We put these walls up, up there, but all those walls are just walls because inside we're really insecure. We're really scared. So we put these walls up that, you know, I'm, I'm tough and I'm strong and, you know, I don't need nobody. But real talk, real talk, behind those walls, you're really scared. You, the, the, the scripture says that they, that they they melted, they melted, they melted, amen. Their hearts melted, their hearts did melt, amen. And there was no more courage in any man. Why? Because of your Lord, your God, he is God, amen. So here we see she's having this discourse with them about God being God. And then she goes on further to say, you know what? Because I hate y'all, because I hate y'all, I want some recompense, okay? I, you know, come on, Rahab was about her business. She she understood, she understood. I, I, I like to believe because she willed and dealed and she knew how to get the best price for everything. She said, listen, even though Rahab was not yet converted, she still was able to use her carnal 
uh, tactics to get what she needed. Come on, sometimes we come to God and we are new, new, uh, new babes in Christ and we still got some fleshly, earthly, carnal ways. Come on, we still come to God. Listen, the scripture lets us know Rahab lied to the king, right? She no doubt was, you know, shrewd in business. God didn't honor, he doesn't, he doesn't honor lying. But again, she didn't know lying was wrong. She understood in wartime, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Because she lived in Jericho amongst pagan people. So she knew how to make things happen and necessarily not take the best moral way to do things. But again, she wasn't privy to the laws, amen, the 10 commandments and how they should live. So at this point, even though she was lying, when she hid them and lied to the, the officers, we see here, even now, with the spies, she's still using her old ways. Come on, she using her old ways. But even using her old ways, it turns out being a blessing. She tells the, the two spies, listen, because I dealt kindly with you and because I, I took care of you, I need you to do the same for me. Cause I know y'all coming back. I know Joshua, I've heard about all the great exploits. I understand that the promised land is yours, right? I know you're coming for us, but I need you to deal kindly with me and all of my household because I've dealt kindly with you. See, she knew how to get what she needed. And there was nothing wrong with that because really that term kindness is uh, has said, a Hebrew word has said, which means a covenantal agreement that God makes, he covers, amen. It's a covenant of love. It's an agreement. And so she said, listen, I dealt kindly with you. You deal kindly with me. She's making a covenant with them right then and there and saying, listen, when you come back, I need you to make sure that you spare my family because I spared your life. And the two by spies said, you know what, Rahab, you got it a life for a life. And I promise that when we come back, we're going to look out for you. And she's, and then they further on went to say, you know what? I'm going to help y'all out. And when I help y'all out, I'm going to lower y'all out through this rope, through the wall to get out. And when I, when you, she didn't just help them out, but she helped them out and gave them some direction. She said, listen, when you get out, run to the hills run to the hills and stay there three days because the officers are out looking for you. Can I tell you, you don't know where your blessing is coming from. You don't know who God is setting up to help you to advance to where you got to go. Don't always look for it from in your household. Don't always look for it for your church members. Don't always look for it in your family. Don't always look for it from those friends that you think are the closest to you. God will use an enemy. God will use a heathen. He will use whoever is willing to bless, amen, the people of God. And so he uses Rahab not only to hide them, but she helps them with the escape. And she tells them, go to the hills. We see in scripture, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. Why? Because that's where my help come from. Run to the hills. Sometimes we got to run. We got to run to Jesus. We got to run to him because that's where our safety, that's where our help comes from. Hallelujah. He's the maker of heaven and earth. So she tells the spies, run to the hills. Go, go to the hills. And I want you to stay there three days. Three days, three days, three days. Come on, three days. Y'all know where I'm going. Three days. Three days is when Jesus rose from the dead. So she tells them, stay there three days. God's going to resurrect this plan. All is not lost. Can I tell you? Can I tell you today, ma'am and sir? Can I tell you, woman, uh, uh, girl or boy, that our God has resurrecting power. He can take a plan. He could take a life. He can take everything that you thought was dead and lost. It looks like the enemy's on your trails and God will resurrect it at the appointed times. Give him three days, hallelujah. Give him three days symbolically and let him resurrect your joy. Three days and let him resurrect your peace. Give him three days and resurrect your life. What you thought was dead and stinking, come on. What you thought was dead and stinking, all you need is a word from the Lord. And so they, before they, she gives them instruction and tell them to go to the hill and hide three days. But she also tells them, okay, forget our covenant. And they say to her, we got you, Rahab. When we come back, we the same cord you letting us down with, this red scarlet rope. Some scriptures say cord or thread. 
But come on, you can't let no grown men down on the thread. It's a rope. The same rope that she hit them with up on the roof. Come on, somebody. The same materials that she used to hide them was the same material she used, amen, at a different time to, amen, that rope that she made out of flax that was dyed red, scarlet, she used to lower them down. What am I saying? That red cord, that red rope is symbolic of the blood of Jesus. It's symbolic of the price that he prayed, he paid, he paid. Come on. In the uh we see it in the book of Exodus. Amen. We see it. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it. We see it when they are coming out of e I mean, when they come in out of Egypt, right before they come out of Egypt, hallelujah. Uh, the last uh, plague that hits the hits Egypt. By the way, hallelujah, Moses declares this last plague on Egypt because they didn't want to let Israel go in Genesis. Amen. He, uh, the last plague is death. Death. The death judgment is coming. And so uh, Moses tells the children of Israel, by direction of God, listen, if that death angel, that de judgment of death, if you want to make sure it don't come and kill yours, put the blood on the door. Put the blood on the door. Put the, come on, what was called, the blood is red, it's scarlet, it's crimson. Put the blood on the door. Where else we see blood? We see the blood of Jesus when he was taking the stripes and bearing our afflictions and bearing our diseases and bearing our burdens, amen. On the cross, we see the blood, the blood that was dripping from his back, dripping from his body, dripping from him, the blood that he shed so that we could have eternal life. That cord represented the blood of Jesus and the same cord, the same cord that Rahab used to bless them is the same cord, amen. The same cord that Rahab used Amen. To let them escape is the same court that's going to be used. Hallelujah. To rescue her. And one thing about Rahab, the harlot, come on. She wasn't just the harlot. Rahab was concerned about her family. Rahab, hallelujah. She told the children, she told the two spies, listen, when y'all come back, I need you not only to save me, save my father, save my mother, save my brethren, save everybody in my house. Because listen, when you really have an encounter and when you start to understand who God is, you don't want them just for yourself. You want them to save your family. You want them to save, amen, your brother that's out there on drugs. You want them to save your father who just don't know how to come home. Come on. You want to save your mother whose mind who may be troubled, amen, and depressed and don't know how to come out the room. You want them to save your sister, hallelujah, who's an A student, who's a stellar, amen, citizen but she need Jesus to come on. You want to save your grandmama. Them. Rahab was not selfish by any means. She knew the remedy for their deliverance was that red rope. The remedy for your life, the remedy for this world is Jesus. My old bishop used to say, Jesus is the answer. He's the answer for what the world today, above him, above him, above him. There's no other Jesus. Jesus is the way. He was the remedy then, and he's the remedy now. And so that red cord, the spies say, listen, when we come back, let that same red cord be hanging in that window. Because when we see that red cord, guess what? We know that's your house. And we promise, we make a vow, we take an oath, we're going to deal kindly with you, and we're going to spare everything in your house, Rahab. And so before they could even leave, amen, they lay going on to, Rahab is bonding that cord in her house. She getting ready. She getting ready for that great day. Are you getting ready? Come on. Are you ready for Christ's return? Are you ready to meet him in the air? Have you made Jesus your choice? And if you haven't today, Make him, make him the Lord and Savior of your life. Invite him to come in. Invite him to come in and save your soul. Because guess what? Jesus, just like those spies were coming back, just like Joshua was coming back, Yeshua was coming back, the one that saves and delivers was coming back to take that promised land. Jesus said he promised he's coming back. He went to prepare a place for us, but he said, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself. Come on, somebody. And he said, when he's coming back, He's coming back for his bride, for his church. Rahab was symbolic of the church. And so she, like the church, she wanted to get as many as she could in her house. I know she probably thought, listen, 
mama, daddy, sister, brother, listen, this is what's going to go down. We got to be prepared. We got to be ready. She probably reached out to her cousins and them and her, her best friends and the ones that worked in her establishment. Listen, whoever so will, come on in. Come on. Whoever so will, come on in my house. There's safety. And not our shot. There's safety in the house. And so Rahab is the church. Our assignment is not to be famous. Our assignment is not to put our name in life. Our assignment is to take dominion and advance the kingdom and win souls, hallelujah, for the glory and the honor of God. And so right there, hallelujah, my soul is rejoicing. My soul is rejoicing in the God of our salvation today because he's yet able to save. He's yet able to heal and he's yet able to deliver. I know it's not a famous message anymore today. We don't preach you happy with shouting and dancing and money and naming and claiming and everything yours and go for it and the, secure the bag. But let me tell you something, the gospel today will be preached until every corner of this world and then Jesus is coming back. What's the gospel? It's the good news. It's the good news. The good news that he came. The good news that he died. The good news that he rose for your sin. Hallelujah. The good news is that he was the final and ultimate sacrifice. He was a substitution for our sins. What we could not do. What lambs couldn't do. Hallelujah. What man couldn't do. Hallelujah. God wrapped up in flesh came down. Hallelujah. Through the womb of a woman named Mary. Hallelujah. Was raised up. Walk this earth 33 years just to die for you and I so that we might have eternal life. Choose ye this day who you're going to serve. Don't I, Listen, it don't matter where you come from. It don't matter how you were raised. It doesn't matter. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Come on, Jesus saves to the utmost. We don't see songs like that no more. Jesus saves. Who would have thought he would take a, a prostitute, a Canaanite, a heathen, worship, co-worshiper that pricked their hearts and used them, prepared them. He didn't just prepare her to help the spies. He prepared her to convert and give her life. So the scripture goes on in chapter six, Joshua chapter six and says, amen. The spies go back between chapter two, amen. And verse six, between that time, the spies go back and they tell Joshua, listen, Joshua, we got this. They are so scared. They are so scared. They are so scared. We got it. Not only we got it, but here, here's one thing we did. We made a covenant with our girl Rahab because she looked out for the brothers. She looked out, she looked out for us. She could have turned us over, come on. She could have turned us over, but she looked out for us. She protected us. And not only did she protect us, she she called, helped us escape. Not only did she helped us escape, but she told us what to do when we escape. So come on, when we go back, we got to spare everybody in her house. And we told her, we told her Joshua, that when we go back, that you know, a sign that that's her house was gonna be a red cord in the window. So Joshua was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let, we, we got this. And so the scripture goes on to say that they didn't go right back then and there because they had to cross the Jordan. They were on the other side of Jordan. They had to cross the Jordan. Amen. Another miracle God performs, no doubt. The Canaanites are watching and looking because they could see the Israelites. Again, their towers and their walls were so high. They could see across the Jordan, this camp of Israel, millions of people ready to walk and come across the Jordan River. And at this season and this time, the Jordan was swelling. The Jordan swelled or I mean, it was flooding with water. And so they look and probably going, these fools, where are they going? They're about to drown and kill all of these people. But I know Rahab perceived and was like, come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Do it, God. Do it. Do it, God. Do it. Come on. Come on, God. Hallelujah. I know you're coming back because you said you're going to come back for me and my family. I heard about the great exploits. I know that you can do this. What is water to God? I know you part of the Red Sea. This Jordan ain't nothing for you. And sure, you're right. Sure, you're right. Sure, you're right. They get to the amen. You know, we see and. Now, before they get to the Red Sea, amen, in Genesis, how Moses has to stretch forth his rod and it, and, it, and it parts. Come on, it parts, hallelujah. And as it parts, amen, they cross over and dry land. Well, this time, the instructions, Joshua didn't have to do anything, right? 
They had to just walk by faith. Joshua tells them, listen, we not, I'm not stretching nothing. What we doing is we gonna go by faith. And when you put your foot in the brink of that river, watch God work, <laughs> watch God work. Come on, faith without works is dead. So that see the is the, the generation that died off in the wilderness. They didn't have faith, so everything had to be you know done. I had to stretch forth the rod, let water come out the rock, stretch forth the rod, Moses, and part the Red Sea. You know, so many signs had to be done for them because they had no faith. But this generation and this leader, Joshua, tells them, "Let's prepare ourselves because we're going over." Right. The scripture tells us they prepared themselves. They put they, the, 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 the priests bear the Ark of the Covenant up and, you know, the, the armies, they get ready to go. But they said, send you the first. Come on, come on. Send, send, send forth the praise first. Send forth the priests, the Levites. Come on. Let the Ark go before you. Can I tell you, don't try to make your own way. Don't try to make your own way. Let God be for you. Let God be for you. Come on. My husband preached this a couple of weeks ago. Let God. He's not for you. He's not just, you know for you, but he is before you. And so they send the priest with the Ark of the Covenant. As soon as they feet touch the water, our God is all that, the water, amen, starts to break up. It starts to part, amen. And they cross over. And then we see, amen, that they gather 12 stones as a memorial. Joshua begins to circumcise his generation, amen, because they had not been circumcised and they prepare to go to war. But wonderful about one thing I love about God is that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And as high as the heavens from the earth is his thoughts. Amen. And so, you know, you would think, OK, Joshua's a military leader and commander. He's leading them from the wilderness into the promised land. Surely he got some strategy that, you know, involves some type of military arsenal. No. God gives Joshua instruction. I want you to march around the walls of Jericho seven days, not seven times, seven days. March around the walls of Jericho once for six days. One time, six days, and one blast of the trumpet, go back. Again, I'm sure the people of Canaan, not Canaans were like, they gotta be kidding me, that's all they got, that's all they got, that's all they got, that's all they got. But could you imagine a military army Thousands of foot feet walking and marching. Everybody's quiet, save the blast of the trumpet, walking around Circum the circumference of your dwelling place. Hallelujah. Taking territory and then going back to camp. To some people, they might have thought it was a joke, but to others, they had to be scared. They were already scared, but could you imagine? Because see, what the enemy tries to do sometimes is deceive you to think that God is not coming. God is not delivering, right? It, it's not the way you think it's, it's going to happen. It's not when you think it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And what the devil tries to do is take the time from when God said it to when it happens to get your faith unhinged. And so no doubt, I know Rahab, she didn't know the strategy. She just knew they were coming. So maybe the first day they came, she was like, what's, what's going on? What's, what? They're going back? And we do that. We do that. You know, God says, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to deliver you off of drugs. I'm going to, you know, heal your family member. I'm going to, you know, bless your life or whatever the promise of the Lord is for you. God tells you get a word from the Lord and you're excited about it and you praise him in advance and you just thankful unto God and you start making preparations and you know, I'm blessed and highly favored. And, oh, I know one day I'm going to be this, that, and the other. And then you got 10 year waiting period. Some 20, some 30, some 50. And you go, where is God? I know he told me that he's coming to deliver me and he's coming to save me, but he ain't come yet. Matter of fact, I'm getting these little glimmers and flickers of, of, of things, but it ain't the full, full deliverance, right? What I used to do, share with you, you know, I used to party hard. Like, I mean, didn't have any type of, you know, since, you know, I wasn't saved, you know, if the clubs was open on Sunday, Sabbath, I'm turning up, you know, if the club was open on Monday, I'm turning up, right, um, I didn't care, I had to go to work the next day, because it was all fun, and unbeknownst to me, somebody was praying for me, and uh, the desire 
started wanting to do things and it didn't happen overnight, right? I used to cuss and it was like, well, you know, I, I don't want to cuss, but you know, I don't know how he going to take this thing from me. And it didn't happen overnight. It's that process called sanctification, that cleansing, setting, separating me from and separa separating me to, right? And it happened gradually. Can I encourage you? God spoke a word to you in his word. Do not abort it. Do not give up. Do not faint during the day of adversity. Strengthen yourself by the reading of the word of God. Strengthen yourself by times of prayer and worship and devotion to God. Build up your faith in God. Because if he said it, he's going to do it. Because the Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. More importantly, God can't lie. I want to encourage you today. I don't care what's going on in the media. I don't care what's going on in your finances. I don't care what's going on in your body. I don't care what's going on in your mind. I don't care what's going on in your heart. Can I tell you he's coming back? Yeah, we've been saying it and saying it, but can I tell you he's coming back? Yeah, grandma said he's coming back. He's coming back. Yeah, they have posters and the uh, preacher on the corner said he's coming back. He's coming back. Don't be deceived by those six days. Symbolically. Because the Bible lets us know on the seventh day, they marched seven times. Come on, the number of completion and perfection. And they didn't, and here's their strategy. On the seventh time that they marched, the whole camp gonna shout. The priest gonna blow a long blast. And those walls came down. The walls came down. Flat. I mean, the scriptures, the wall thing just, you know, wasn't, it wasn't a trickle. It wasn't half done. The walls came down. Amen. And um, the walls came down. The Bible says, uh, Joshua 6, that the walls fall down. Amen. They fall flat. That means nothing missing, nothing broken. Ain't no half job. It's all coming down. Come on. The walls are coming down in your life. The walls of oppression down. The walls of depression down. The wall spirit of infirmity down. Come on. Spirit of poverty down. The walls are coming down. Walls of self uh, inferiority coming down. The walls of low self-esteem coming down. The walls, amen, of fear coming down. They're coming down. They're coming down. Down, hallelujah, just like the walls of Jericho fell flat today, hallelujah, hallelujah, we're believing God to flatten everything in your life that's been holding you and binding you and imprisoning you, suffocating and paralyzing you and telling you, amen, that you will never get free. Today, I serve notice that deliverance has come, salvation has come to your house. And just like Rahab and just like the promise, everything came down. You guessed it, except Rahab's house. Everything that was in everything, everyone, rather, everyone that was in there. We don't know how many people fit in there, but everybody, nobody was left behind. The Bible lets us know, Joshua said to those spies, go into har the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman, all that she had, as ye swear unto her. God keeps his vow. He keeps his word. He keeps his word. Yeshua keeps his word. Hallelujah. And the Bible says the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her sister and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. What? A blessing. The word of God is so sweet. It's so rich. So rich. This story is so inspiring because it's a message of redemption. It's a message. Hallelujah. The ma no matter what and you've been dealt with. No matter what hole in the wall you've come out of, I don't care if your family is known for shaking and stirring and being the number runners. They probably don't do that no more, but whatever they're known for, I don't care what hole in the wall you came out of. 
Redemption is nigh. What I love about God is that the story lets us know that this Rahab, the harlot, the prostitute, come on, this woman, the Bible lets us know in verse uh, 25, I'm sorry, before I get to verse 25, verse 24 says, and they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Verse 25, and Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. Hallelujah. And the scripture lets us know, amen, that Joshua cursed, cursed anyone. He said, cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and buildeth this city Jericho. And the Lord, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was noised throughout all the country. So listen, Rahab, where she lived, Canaan, the Canaanite harlot, the one that dwelled in the walls, Jericho. Not only was her life spared, but everything that resembled her former life. Not only fell, but it was burnt to the ground. And there was a charge and a curse put out that nobody better not ever build this place again. Can I tell you, God comes to deliver you totally, totally and completely. What I love about the Lord is not only was he coming, he comes to deliver you totally, completely. He used the same Rahab harlot. And the Bible lets us know that she becomes a mother of Israel. This same Rahab the harlot marries an Israelite. Amen. I believe he was one of the spies named Salmon. And they have a child named Boaz. Come on. We know the story. It's recorded in the genealogy of Christ. She's listed in the genealogy of Christ, this harlot, this prostitute is listed in the lineage of Jesus. Don't let nobody tell you that you to this or to that for God to save you. Not only is she listed in the genealogy of Christ, and I'm closing here, the Bible lets us know that she's also listed uh, in Hebrews 11.31, not for her holotry but for her faith. Hebrews 11, 31 says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believe not when she had received the spies with peace. Rahab is listed with Abraham, the father of faith, because of what she did. It's not how you start, but it's how you end. Better is the end of a thing than a beginning thereof. Today, I want to offer Christ to you. If you don't know Jesus in the part of your sins, today is your day. If you're backslidden and have walked away from God because he's married to the backslider, he's still in covenant with you. You've walked away. If that's you today, let's pray. Because it doesn't make sense to live in a hole in the wall, literally and figuratively the rest of your life. When Jesus, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. The borrowed tomb, a cave, it was a hole in the wall. Does it make sense for the one that came and died and rose for you, for you not to experience life everlasting and not just to live, but that you may thrive? Would you receive him today as your Lord and Savior? But you make up in your heart that I need him. I need him. I'm tired. I'm tired of being labeled. I'm tired of being marginalized. I'm tired of being empty. I'm tired of being broken. I'm tired of not understanding the meaning of my life. I'm tired of this trivial. What is life? What is the meaning? I'm tired. They told me one thing and it's another. Surely there is another way. Surely there's peace that I've not known. Surely there's joy unspeakable that I've not known. Surely there's rest for the weary. The Bible lets us know in Romans 10 and 9, it's not hard. You can't, you can't earn salvation. Jesus completed the work on Calvary. There's nothing for you to do but just believe. 
The Bible lets us know in Romans 10 and 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's with the heart that man believeth unto righteousness. That's faith. You got to believe. And it's with confession that sal- confession is made unto salvation. You've got to say it. You've got to say it out your mouth. Father, I pray today for those who have you have drawn by your spirit and by your word. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you for moving. Thank you for your word that speaks. Now we come against anything that would try to hold or hinder those from receiving truth today and receiving you as Lord and Savior. But Father, we pray now. Will you pray with me? Father, I believe that you came, that you died for my sins, that you loved me so much that you were willing to pay the price that I could never pay. You paid a debt that I owe that I could never pay. I believe you did that. And I believe that you paid that price, such a heavy price. And not only did you pay it, but you died because of it. But you rose again. Would you come into my life? I'm a sinner. And no matter how good I live, I'm a sinner. Would you save me? Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. For those of you who have backslidden in, walked away from God and the enemy's trying to beat you up. And you know, he's an accuser of the brethren. He want to lie to you and tell you that you've been so far and done so much, he won't receive you. All you have to do is say, take me back. I'm sorry. Take me back, Lord. I denounce these cares of this world, these lusts of the world. Sorry for walking away from you, but I'm coming back. Just like the prodigals, I'm coming back. And if you return, He'll receive you. I thank God today for the life of Rahab as an example of a person's life who may have been considered a hole in the wall, who God loved enough, used to be in the family of Christ. God bless you. We love you. Until next time, be well.